So, hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Malaysian Research Insider session. Um, welcome back to those of you who have joined us for any of our previous sessions, and a warm welcome if you're joining for the first time. So, my name is Wen Wen, and I'm a microbiology PhD student. I'm currently based at Imperial College London, and I'll be hosting today's session here. So today I'm really happy to welcome our speaker, uh, Jia Zheng, or Jay-Z as I know him. Um, he is actually a friend of mine that I've known for a few years because we did our undergrads together at Imperial College London. And he's an incoming research assistant at the Whitehead Institute at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. He'll be sharing about his research journey and also um, some insights on some of the work that he's done looking at regeneration in planarian flatworms, which you can see in his background right now. Those. So, JT, whenever you're ready, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, well, thanks, Wen Wen, for the introduction. Um, so, hi, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about um, planarians. Um, I won't be talking about like the exact work that I did, but uh, I'll just like give you guys a brief introduction to what are planarians and why they're interesting and why we study them. And yeah, so just a brief introduction to my background. So I um, spent my entire life in Malaysia up to A-levels and then went to Imperial College London for my undergraduate. And then after that, I moved to Germany to University of Heidelberg for my master's. And then during my time here, I got to spend my research semester abroad at the Whitehead Institute, which is part of um, MIT in the US. And so today I'll be talking about the work that I did while I was there. And recently, I just graduated from a master's, and hopefully soon enough, I'll begin my uh, new position as a research assistant in the Whitehead Institute, but this time in a different lab. So no planarians for me in the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, so the theme for today's topic will, about, will be about regeneration. And as you probably know, humans, we humans have very limited regenerative capacity. So some parts of our body, like our liver, is able to regenerate quite well. But if you are talking about, you know, let's say, cutting your heads off of yourself, you'll probably just die immediately. But if, let's say, if let's say you're talking about less critical, critical conditions, like amputating your leg, um, you probably won't die if you are careful enough. And your wound will eventually close up and heal by itself, and you will form a stump. But this stump will not regenerate like a brand new leg. And within the human context, all of this sounds very normal and very expected. But actually, if you look at um, other animals, there are multiple instances where other animals are able to regenerate pretty well. For example, here is a picture of a starfish. And you can cut an arm off of the starfish, and it will regenerate. You can cut this earthworm into two pieces, and it will regenerate. Um, here's a picture of a zebrafish. And you can cut away its tail, and it will regenerate. You can injure part of its eye, you can injure its heart, you can injure its uh, spinal cord and they will regenerate. Here's a picture of an axolotl or a Mexican salamander. You can amputate its limbs, you can cut away its gills throughout these branchy structures. Um, you can injure its heart, you can injure its spinal cord and they'll regenerate as well. And all of these are kind of impossible in humans but somehow they are able to do it. And speaking of regeneration, um, one of the masters of regeneration, arguably, has to be uh, the planarians. So planarians are basically a type of flatworms, and you can find them everywhere, um, in the lakes, in the ponds, underneath a rock. And so today I'll be talking about a specific type of planarian called Schmidtia mediterranea, which is this guy here. And as you can see, they have a rather simplistic anatomical plan. So they have a pair of eyes here, and in the middle of the body, is a pharynx, which is its feeding organ. And what's so amazing about this guy is that you can cut it into, let's say, two pieces, and each of those two pieces will regenerate. You can cut it into a hundred pieces, and each of those hundred pieces will also regenerate into a complete animal. And here I'm going to show you guys a video of a planarian being chopped up into uh, multiple pieces. And as you can see here, each of those pieces will not die and they are still able to move around and swim around uh, quite normally. And if you just leave them alone for like, a f let's say two weeks, by the end of the two weeks, they will have regenerated into complete animals. So let's say you wait for them for like 20 days, 
by end of 20 days, each of those pieces that you saw just now would have regenerated into a complete animal. And you may be wondering why we should study planarians. So uh, as you can probably tell, planarians and humans, we look very different from each other, right? So why should we even care about planarians? Right, it turns out that many genes that can be found in planarians are also, can also be found in humans. And so theoretically, the genes that planarians use to regenerate can also be found in humans too. And if we and planarians have very similar sets of genes, how is it that planarians are able to regenerate so well, but we don't? So one possible explanation is that maybe planarians are able to use these genes differently. And so for example, if you cut off the head of a planarian, maybe they are able to switch on some of these genes, which then eventually allow them to regenerate. And somehow we humans, even though we have these genes, we don't switch these genes on and therefore we can't regenerate. This is just one possible explanation, but it's definitely uh, exp an explanation that is worth uh, pursuing. So uh, what we can do now is that we can go to these planarians and then we can start to study which genes do these planarians use to regenerate. And hopefully one day we can then transfer this knowledge to humans and then you know, somehow find a way to switch on these genes and then see if we can then eventually regrow a missing arm, for example. But before we can do that, we need to first find out which genes do planarians use to regenerate. And one way to answer this question uh, is to use this uh, strategy that I'm gonna explain using an analogy with a computer. So imagine you have a computer you open up a computer and you see that inside the computer, it has you know, many different complicated parts. And let's say you are wondering how this computer prevents itself from overheating. So one, way, one thing that you can do is that you can individually remove each computer parts one by one, and you see which part it is that when you remove it, um, causes the computer to overheat very easily. So let's say you remove this part and I reassemble the computer. You switch, it, you switch the computer back on, and then you let it run for a while and you start to notice that, okay, now the computer gets overheated very easily. So what this tells you is that maybe this part that, have, that you have just removed is very important to prevent the computer from overheating itself. And so to find out which genes do planarians use to regenerate, we can do something of a very similar logic. Um, so obviously planarians, they do not have uh, computer parts, but like us, they have genes. And uh, we know that genes are the ones that you know, tell us what to do, right? So uh, obviously we can't go into every single individual cell of a planarian and like physically remove each gene one by one and see, you know, which gene it is that when you remove it causes them to unable to uh, regenerate properly. But what we can do is that we can use a technique called RNAi or RNA interference. And how does this work? So we know that genes exist in the form of DNA. And when genes get switched on, they'll use this DNA to make copies of RNA. And the RNA will eventually become proteins. And then proteins will then carry out their respective function, which will give us a phenotype, for example, where the planarians can regenerate. So now imagine, let's say you are interested in finding out whether gene one is important for regeneration. You can use RNA to specifically remove or inhibit RNAs of gene one. And then when you do this, you will also stop production of protein made by gene one. So when you have no more RNAs and no more proteins of gene one, you can then now answer the question whether gene one is required for regeneration. So imagine you have a worm without gene one, you cut away its head, and if gene one is not required for regeneration, um, even if you remove gene one, the head will just regenerate very normally and very perfectly. But if gene one is required for regeneration, you will start to see that maybe um, you will not regenerate anything, or maybe you will regenerate a head, but this head may look very abnormal. For example, it may, it may look very big or it may look very small. Or maybe instead of regenerating a head, you will regenerate something else like let's say a tail. Because it's very important. Uh, so it's not just enough to regenerate anything at all. It's also very important re to regenerate the correct thing in the correct form, correct size, correct proportion, etc. So now you can repeat this process to gene two and to as many genes as you want. And so then eventually you have a list of genes that you suspect or you know are required by planarians to regenerate properly. And indeed, this was done back in 2005 by a group of scientists, including uh, from our lab. What they did is that they used RNAi to one by one inhibit hundreds or even thousands of genes in planarians. And then they cut these planarians away. They, they cut these planarians um, at its head and at its tail. So you have a middle piece like this. And what they found is that there are many genes that when they inhibit them using RNAi, 
causes this planarians to regenerate abnormally. So this is how a normal planarian will look like when they regenerate. Um, so you hear they regenerated a head and regenerate a tail. And so usually newly freshly regenerated tissues, they appear as white and we call this basima. And if you see here, there are multiple instances, for example, this one, um, they have a basima formation, but it's much smaller than what you would see in a normal womb. Here, there's also basima formation, but it's much wider. Here, if you look carefully at the tip of the head and at the tip of the tail, there is an indentation. And these are just you know, a few examples where regeneration can go wrong after you inhibit uh, specific genes. And very importantly, many of these genes that were found can also be found in humans. So once again, reinforces the power of using planarians to study regeneration or, any, or even just any aspect of biology. So ever since uh, we have found a list of genes that planarians use to regenerate, um, we have also been interested in understanding how planarians know what to regenerate. So imagine you have a planarian, um, you cut away its tail, now the animal is tailless, eventually it will regrow a tail, right? But how does it know whether to regenerate a tail or to regenerate something else like a head. So back in 2008, um, there were three papers that were published at around the same time. And all three of those of these papers stumbled upon this gene called beta-catenine. And beta-catenine is a gene that is very conserved across the animal kingdom. So planarians have them, we have them, mice have them, fish have them, flies have them. Basically, almost every uh, animal has them. And what they found is that when they use RNA to inhibit beta-catenin, so now you have a worm without beta-catenin, you cut away its head, you cut away its tail, and you take this middle piece. So a normal animal would regenerate a head and a tail, but when this animal has no beta-catenin, it will regenerate two heads. So at the front end, you will regenerate one head, and then at the other end, you will also regenerate another head. How do you know that it's a head? Um, as you can see here, there are two eyes here, and usually you only see eyes in a head, right? And then now, if let's say you take another worm again without beta catenin, and this time you cut away its tail, and at the same time you introduce some injuries along the sides of the body. So now you have a worm that looks like this. And what they found is that um, for this worm, at every injury site that you have just introduced, they will form a head. So now this um, animal will form six heads. So together, these tell us that um, beta-catenin is a gene that inhibits head regeneration because when you do not have beta-catenin, you just form heads everywhere. And so this is basically one of the genes that we now know is used by planarians to inform itself uh, what kind of tissues that they need to regenerate after certain injuries. Um, so in, in addition to knowing how planarians know what to regenerate, uh, we are also very interested in understanding how planarians generate new tissues. So for example, here you have a planarian. You cut away its tail. Eventually this tail, is this animal will regrow a tail. But now the question is, where do the cells of a new tail come from? Well, it turns out that they use uh, these stem cells to regenerate these uh, new structures. So what are stem cells? Um, so for example, we humans, we have trillions of cells. And actually, most of our cells are differentiated cells, which means they do not divide. So for example, our neuron, our skin cells, our heart muscle cells, these, they, these cannot divide, and they are differentiated cells. But at the same time, in our body, we have a group of uh, cells called stem cells. Uh, these stem cells are able to divide. And when they divide, one of the daughter cells will basically become a clone of itself. So one of the daughter cells will replace the origin stem cell. And then the other daughter cell can then undergo you know, a few more rounds of division. And eventually they can differentiate into any cells that you want. So neurons, fat cells, muscle cells, and so on. And it turns out that planarians use these kind of stem cells to regenerate. Um, how do you know that? So uh, to prove that planarians use stem cells to regenerate, what we can do is that we can remove stem cells from planarians. And then we can cut these planarians without stem cells. Let's say we cut away its head. And if stem cells are required for regeneration, when you remove it, uh, you will not be able to regenerate a new head, right? So now the question is, how do we remove these stem cells in the first place? So we know that stem cells are dividing cells. And one way to remove dividing cells or to kill, stem, to kill dividing cells is to use irradiation, like how we would use uh, radiotherapy to kill cancer cells in cancer patients. So we can use irradiation to kill these stem cells in planarians 
an irradiation will cause, will cause DNA damage. And when there is DNA damage and in dividing cells, the cells will just die. And so eventually you have a planarian with no stem cells. So here you have a planarian with lots of stem cells as represented as these um, circles. Should them with irradiation, now you have an animal without any stem cell. So now imagine you have a normal worm with lots of stem cells. You cut away its head, you cut away its tail, you take the middle piece, you wait for a while, eventually this middle piece will regenerate a new head and a new tail. As you can see, there is blastoma formation here, blastoma formation here. Um, now you take another worm that was irradiated, so no stem cells left. You cut away its head, you cut away its tail, you take this middle piece, and what you notice is that eventually this middle piece will not regenerate at all. But here you do not see any you know, white tissue blastema formation. Here you also don't see any white blastema formation. And then this worm will also kind of just curl up. So this tells us that uh, you, know, you need stem cells to regenerate because if you remove these stem cells, they don't regenerate. And actually for, we kind of know that they need stem cells to regenerate for quite a while now. And ever since then, people have been really interested in finding out how these stem cells behave as stem cells. So what genes do these stem cells use to make them function as stem cells during regeneration? And back in 2005, we found that there's this one gene called SMITRE2. And if we use RNA to remove SMITRE2, so now you have a worm without SMITRE2, but with lots of stem cells. You cut away its head, you cut away its tail, you take the middle piece, what you notice is that this middle piece will eventually not regenerate as well. So here again, you don't see any um, white head blastema. You also don't see any white blastema at the tail. And the animal also curl up. So basically very similar to what you see in an irradiated animal. So together, what this all tells us is that planarians need stem cells to regenerate and that uh, stem cells need a gene called SMETV2 SMET to function. Um, so everything that I've just told you this far was actually discovered more than a decade ago. And ever since then, uh, the planarian community, community has made a huge progress in better understanding how planarians regenerate. But even so, there are still you know, many big questions that we do not have good answers to. For example, we know that planarians have a lot of stem cells and these stem cells, they can you know, keep on dividing and dividing and dividing and make any type of cell types that they want. So in this picture, these stem cells are visible at these red dots. Now actually, we humans have these kind of stem cells that are able to keep on dividing and dividing and dividing and you know, make any cell types that they want as well. But we only have them very like, transiently. So we only have them when we were embryos, before we were even born. And as we age, we kind of just lose this pool of stem cells. But somehow, planar planarians are able to maintain this pool of stem cells indefinitely throughout their lifetime. And we still don't know how they do this. And another big question that the field has been really interested in is how do genes such as beta catenin tell stem cells to not form hate tissues? So as I told you, um, stem cells, they can form anything that they want. They can make a new head, they can make a new tail, they can make a new brain, they can make new eyes, they can make new intestines, anything that they want. But when you have beta catenin, this beta catenin will stop stem cells from forming hate tissues. Right, because when you do not have beta catenin, you just start forming heads everywhere. So then how does this beta catenin tell stem cells specifically to not form head tissues? This is still a big question uh, within the field and we are still actively looking answers for. And then um, unsurprisingly, beta catenin is just one of the many genes that planarians use, that planarians use to, tell itself, to tell themselves what to regenerate. Um, for example, there's another gene called nodum, which kind of behave or act as the opposite of beta catenin. So in a normal worm, when you cut away its head, you cut away its tail, you will regenerate a head and a tail. But when this worm doesn't have nodum, instead of regenerating a head and a tail, you regenerate two tails because you don't see any eye formation. Um, so yeah, so these are just you know, a few, very few examples of the big questions that we are very interested in. And obviously there are multiple, many more questions that the field in general are very interested in as well and are still actively looking answers for. And before we move on to the Q&A session, I'd just like to uh, spend a few seconds to express my gratitude to my fellow members of the Regin Lab. And, thank, and I'd like to thank them for being great colleagues and great mentors and just nice friends to be around with. And yeah, thank you. 
Okay, cool. Thanks, Jay-Z. That was a really informative presentation. So um, we'll go ahead and try and answer a few questions now. So we'll start off with some general questions. I think everyone is quite interested to learn a bit more about Tanarians. So the first really general question that we'll start off with, someone asks, is a planarian a parasitic flatworm? No, so they are free living. Uh, as I mentioned just now, you can find them everywhere. You can find them in the lakes and the ponds. And yeah, they're free living. They are not parasitic. Okay, so I think a follow-up question to that, uh, Apple asks, what do you actually feed planarians and where do you keep them? I'm guessing in the lab. Okay, uh, so in the wild, planarians are actually scavengers. So they feed on decaying materials. Um, in the lab, we actually feed them cow's liver. So every year we will buy cow's liver from like the butcher or something. And then we would like blend it and homogenize it because obviously liver is uh, solid. So we kind of like homogenize it to become a little bit more liquidy. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, that's how, how we feed them. And then we keep them in like just plastic containers like Tupperware. Okay. So they're very like, low maintenance. So I don't know why, but like, because with bacteria, I, like, I, you put them in an incubator, right? Do you keep them in like a temperature control yeah, yeah, yeah. area? We put oh. them in, in, in an incubator to like standardize their, because obviously their growth can depend on temperature. Okay. So we keep them at a specific constant temperature. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Jake has asked, a follow-up question to the food question. So why liver specifically? And I think he's asked if, is liver more nutritious for any, for any specific reason for planarians? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. I guess because nobody eats liver, so like, it's like a byproduct of the meat production, but I don't know. Maybe it's like also easier to uh, Obtain. You know, homogenize them and like oh, make okay. them more liquidy. Yeah. Okay. So we actually perform RNA by mixing the double strand RNAs into the liver. Oh, so you and feed so they, the RNA to them? Yeah. Oh, so okay. I guess because of this, it has to be a bit more liquidy, the food. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Um, uh, so Alia is asking now, like, and this has to do with the whole regeneration part of planarians now, but how do you kill a planarian if they can constantly regenerate and are they effectively immortal? Yeah, so if you just leave them alone and you give them enough food and they are healthy, they can probably just live on forever. So actually, um, I think many people also, very, like, they are always wondering, do they, sense, do they sense pain if you cut them? And why did they just, why they just don't die? So actually, um, they reproduce asexually by splitting themselves so they, they will split their tail off from, their, from themselves. Which, this is how they reproduce. And so I would just leave them on, leave them alone with ample amount of nutrients. They'll just do that and just keep on reproducing themselves. So they are basically immortal. And then what's the question? Uh, so how can you kill them? Well, if yeah. you, you boil them, you treat them with ethanol, you cook them, you crush them, they can die from diseases and yeah. So that's how you kill them. Okay, so that's interesting because the next question that Tom had was, is there a minimum size limit that a planarian can regenerate from? So, like, you know, if you reduce it all the way down to a single cell, which I guess you might if you crush them, right? Could it regenerate from that single cell? Um, so I think the most extreme example someone has done is that they took a piece of a planarian that is, I think, 279th, times smaller than original worm. And this piece can regenerate into a whole animal eventually. Um, so yeah. And their stem cells can actually, because their stem cells can actually form any tissues, right? So mm -hmm. if let's say you have a planarian and then you treat it with irradiation, so now uh, the planarian has no more stem cells. And then, so they, can, they cannot make any more new tissues, right? But if let's say you just transplant just one stem cell into this irradiated animal, eventually this irradiated animal can regenerate anything that it wants. So like oh. these stem cells basically can, you know, just make a whole new, in theory, can make a whole new organism. So you could technically just have one stem cell and 
in theory, yeah. that should be enough. Okay. Um, so Apple has a question. If a planarian doesn't need a brain, do you know how it coordinates things like breathing if the nervous system is cut off? Because I guess when you cut off the head and then you're getting, you're separating the brain from the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So how does that work in terms of coordinating? Uh, so yeah, that I don't know. Um, so actually they don't breathe. They okay. do not have a, so they just uh, get oxygen by just diffusion. Um, and then, yeah, so if let's say you cut away its tail, so now the tail doesn't have a brain, doesn't have like a mouth that you can eat, so it just doesn't eat. Um, you would just use whatever that's left behind in this cell to make a new brain, a new mouth, and then once the mouth is formed, only it will start to eat. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's almost like it's using its own reserve tissue. Yeah, it's using as whatever energy it has. Source. Yeah. <laughs> that's why when oh, you cut, okay. Okay, so that's why when you cut off a tail, this tail doesn't regenerate. So let's say a, a planarian is like five cm long. Mm -hmm. you cut off its tail, this tail doesn't regenerate into an animal that's five cm long immediately. It will regenerate something that's like maybe one cm. Yeah. So that you know it has and within this one cm it has all the organs that it needs, and eventually it will then regrow into something that's 5 cm. So once it has the mouth, then it can actually go to its full size. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because okay. to grow, you need energy, you need yeah. nutrients, and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So I wonder then, like, if you cut off, you know, like the planarian behind you and it had all of its heads, then would it then grow properly at the same rate? Because <laughs> it has a mouth. Uh, I don't know. Well, so actually this planarian has mm -hmm. only one mouth. It's actually a Peter Cannonin RNA animal. And oh. you just leave them long enough and you will just like start forming heads everywhere, even you don't induce any injury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it has multiple heads, but it only has one mouth. So why do the other heads don't form a mouth? Oh, so actually the mouth is not in the head. So <gasps> the mouth is in the <laughs> pharynx. If, I, if you remember, you have uh -huh. this best screen. So it's not where the eyes are. It's not close no. to where that is. Okay. <laughs> People are going like, what? No. Uh, yeah, so can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the pharynx and this is where the mouth is. So uh, within this pharynx, there's like a muscle, muscular tube. And when it senses that, let's say there is a food here, this tube would then come out from the mouth that is around here and like grab on the food and then like pull the food to the inside of the stomach and then you oh. digest it. Yeah, the is, mouth that is, why you, is that why you cut the, the middle section off because it has the mouth? when you're doing these experiments? Uh, well, it depends on what kind of experiments you want to do. Okay. So, but when you get that middle, that's where the mouth is, right? For a lot of those things that you showed just now. Sorry, because you like for a while, I couldn't catch. Um, so like, you know those experiments that you showed just now, like where you're cutting the middle section, that is where the mouth is? Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Just checking but for that, because we want to see whether the head and both the head and tail can generate. Mm, okay, okay. Okay, um, I'll just move on to the next question then. So Faz, uh, Fazli on Zoom and also Junchen from Facebook asked some very similar questions. So are the newly generated planarians uh, more like twins or parent and child? Uh, well, so they are asexual, mm. right? Meaning... Yeah, so when they reproduce, they're basically, they're basically making clones of themselves. So they have the same genome. So yeah, I would say they are more like twins rather than parent with child. Okay, but can planarians undergo sexual reproduction in any yeah, way? Yeah, so there are two types of plan So the species that I showed you just now, Mitea mm -hmm. they can either exist as asexual or sexual. And when they are sexual, they are hemophrytic. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they have both male and female organs. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Cool. Um, so Duncan on Zoom asks, does planarian regeneration research translate well to mammalian models? Um, so what we do with planarians is to try to find out like the basic like mechanisms or just like, you know, in general, what do you need to regenerate? Um, some of the genes that we know are required for regeneration are indeed very important in stem cells in humans as well. 
So for example, there's this one gene called BMP that is required by planarians to regenerate. And BMP is also very important in like stem cells in mammals as well. So for example, uh, let's say you have a mouse and then you cut away its finger and people have shown that if you give the BMP to this finger, to this mm -hmm. injury site, it can like regrow much better than we, you don't give them anything. So like, yeah, I guess the basic principles do hold true in some, to some extent in, you know, from planarians to like mammals. Okay. I wonder if people have considered delivering that as a, a wound healing compound. I'm guessing someone must have thought of that. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, there are still a lot of like unknown questions because mm. I mean, sure, we know that let's say you know BMP is required for planarians to regenerate, but we don't know how. I mean, one of the biggest questions right now is, okay, we know that maybe planarians require this gene to regenerate, therefore maybe humans, if you switch on these genes, we can also regenerate. But now the question is, how do we switch on these genes? Because you want to switch it on, but you also don't want to switch on too much that you know you just we, you just like make cells divide like crazy and then you eventually get cancer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Next question. Uh, Ying Shen from Facebook asks, uh, if a planarian which has two tails and without a head, is that considered alive? Uh, in, like in general, she's asking like, what is the physiology of a planarian? Uh, yeah, if they have two heads, they are alive. And these two heads will like, pull against each other and try to move in their own direction. Oh, I if think she's asking that. if, what if it has two tails and no head? Uh, then is that considered alive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they can still move. And yeah, they are still alive. Basically. Okay. So yeah, I guess it depends. Like, how will you classify them as being alive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, um, so we get these two heads by inhibiting this gene called nodem mm -hmm. using RNA. But when the RNA effects wear out and you cut it again, eventually one of these tails will become a head. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it still has the capacity to reform a proper organism. So I guess mm -hmm. maybe that means it's still alive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. So Sean asks, can planarians develop cancer? Uh, not that we know of. Okay, that's quite interesting because yeah. they're full of these rapidly dividing cells. Yeah, somehow they are able to control them very nicely, unlike us. Mm. So I, I'm, I mean, I don't know like how much you know about just the whole planarian field, but do people then use these as organisms to look at? I don't know how they protect against cancer. Sorry, you lagged again. And <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, like, I guess are people actually looking at these also to study how we can sort of protect against cancer? Um, I guess not in a very clinical way, mm. but because we know that, you know, there's like a theory called cancer stem cells. So like cancer cells are like stem cells, but they just divide like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I guess by understanding how planarians use their stem cells, we can kind of, you know, find out the very general basic principles of how, that, you know, what kind of genes they use to prevent the, their stem cells from, mm. you know, doing funny things, for example, and then maybe translate that to other organisms. Yep. Okay. So uh, Jake has another question. If beta catenin loss promotes regeneration, why do you normally need beta catenin in planarians? Um, beta catenin is usually important for development in humans. Yeah, um, so actually, beta catenin is not, it's not required. Like, so if you don't have beta catenin, you'll regenerate. It's just that like you regenerate abnormal things. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, beta catenin per se. Its function is more of like regulating what to regenerate. So we found a beta catenin is usually expressed in a tail. And so it seems that when you do not have beta catenin, you do not have this expression in the tail. So eventually this tail will become a head. Right. 
So like it's more, so basically big cloud kernel is like a GPS that tells stem cells what to do. Okay, so it's not exactly what is controlling the regeneration, but it's sort of telling what needs to be growing at, at places. Yes. Okay, so I think we'll move on to some more technical questions that are used. So Duncan asks, wouldn't it be easier to do RNA-seq to determine what genes are up or down regulated rather than to screen everything with RNA interference? Yeah, so this study that I mentioned just now was done in, what, 2005? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you can do RNA-seq at that time. Uh, Maybe it was but basically, mm, very expensive to do, even if you could do it then. Yeah. yeah, and I guess RNA seq you have because like you can't I don't know like if you just do an RNA seq you can't really find out what gene you require. Well, I guess you can. So definitely there are studies where you know they cut an animal and then they do RNA seq at like you know zero hour after injury, one hour after injury, twenty six hour injury, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And these definitely tell us some. You know, candidate genes that we know are, let's say, upregulated up during regeneration. But yeah, I guess at that time it's probably easier to just do like an RNA screen. Okay. And yeah, even if you use, even if you manage to use RNA seq to find out which genes are upregulated or down or downregulated, you eventually still need to use RNA to like prove functionally whether what you found in RNA seq holds true you know, in a phenotype level. Yeah, you still need to validate it using RNAi, right, eventually. Um, yeah, so Shao has another question about RNAi. So she asks, how do you conduct experiments using RNAi efficiently to identify one or a few out of thousands of genes which potentially contribute to regeneration? Um, maybe she's referring to that 2005 study as well, because you said they, they did it on loads and loads of genes. Yeah, so just... you know, how do you do that? <laughs> Yeah, basically efficient. just, you know, take one worm, RNA one gene, take another worm, RNA one gene, another worm, RNA one gene, and you have like, with this you can test like hundreds or thousands of genes. And eventually you have a list of genes that you, you know, can tell you that whether it's required for regeneration or not. So they generated like a worm library then, I guess. Yeah, you would I mean, call it's that. very painstaking. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. Uh, so what technique do you use to confirm that the stem cells are dead in those irradiated um, planarians? Right. Um, so we know that stem cells are actively dividing. Mm -hmm. And one way to test whether there are cells that are actively dividing is by giving them this thing called BRDU. So BRDU is basically an analog of thymidine. So our DNA is made of ATCG. BRDU can replaced T. And one good thing about BRDU is that you can visualize them. So when you do not have cells that are dividing, that would mean that you do not have DNA replication going on. So when you do not have DNA replication going on, you will not need to uh, you know, make new DNAs. Therefore, you will not need all these ATCGs. And so when you do not see BRDU incorporating, that means there's no division going on. That for it means that stem cells are dead because there's no division going on. Okay, so did you visualize these by microscopy? Yeah, you can do that. Um, okay, like because you can make this BRDU fluoresce. Mm. Okay. Uh, next question. So you mentioned uh, that there are no transgenic tools for planarians to generate mutants. Um, do you know why this is the case, or are there problems with developing these tools? Yeah, so um, in order to make a transgenic, let's say, using, let's say using CRISPR, you will need to deliver the CRISPR machinery to a single cell zygote. So then mm -hmm. eventually you have the whole animal, every single cell is a transgenic. But the thing with planarian is that if you do that with the sexual strain of the planarian, the thing is the zygote or the embryos develop within like a site that is quite inaccessible, like physically. And therefore you can't uh, deliver these CRISPR machineries into the single cell zygote. Since we know that uh, stem cells that are able to divide and form anything, people have tried to, let's say, you know, electroporate all this CRISPR machinery 
into stem cells, but somehow these stem cells are very fragile. So if you do that, they just die. Yeah. Okay, so the limitation is mostly on the delivery of the system then? Yep. Ah, oh, okay. Right, right, right. So I guess, hmm, I'm just thinking like, could you potentially like deliver it to just like a specific area of tissue then? Like if you're not planning on making an entirely transgenic organism, yeah, I mean, so then you would go, you would take the stem cells and let's say electroporate or something, right? But, but that's again, not, yeah. Yeah, they are very fragile, so they just die. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, cool. So I think that's all the general and technical questions that we received. Um, and this is like a question that we tend to ask everyone during the session. So what are your career aspirations after... You, this whole research assistant job at MIT, like where do you see yourself after that? Uh, well, hopefully, so my original plan is to like um, stay in this position for like, you know, one or two years. And then my original plan was to like apply for a PhD end of next year. And, but with like the pandemic and everything, seems that everything's being delayed. So I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I guess eventually I will apply for a PhD. Okay, yeah, everything is quite uncertain now, right? But I guess, is, is your plan then to try and stay in academia? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> I guess, you know, just whatever opportunities bring me to. Mm. Okay. Oh, Apple just added on. So uh, would you like to do your PhD working with planarians? Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind. They are very interesting. And... Um, yeah, I think there's a lot that you can do with planarians. Mm. But yeah, I mean, so the this coming position that I have, I'll be working on RNA structures. So how, you know, RNA folding can cause effect in, let's say, splicing. Um, yeah, just RNA regulation in general. Mm. And they're actually working on coronavirus now and see how the genome folds and everything. So yeah, it's a basically a brand new field for me and I'll see how it goes. Okay, yeah, so all the best with that. Um, Duncan actually asks as well if, uh, he says, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask, but uh, how has uh -huh. the US ban sort of affected you in terms of the visa and stuff? It's up to you yeah. if you want to answer I mean, or not. I don't know, <laughs> it just means that probably well, the thing is that you, so there, for those of you who don't know, who didn't know, um, Trump just like recently announced to suspend visa issuance uh, to everyone, well, not everyone, but many people um, for the rest of the year. Uh, but this visa ban, they're in theory shouldn't, it should examine like people working on coronavirus. And actually my lab is working on coronavirus. So we're trying to figure out how we can uh, overcome the ban, so mm. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it seems that I'll, my PI told me that I'll still be able to work remotely. So yeah, I was, you know, definitely keep myself busy and occupied, regardless okay. of the situation. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, uh, good luck. Um, yeah, Apple also said like good luck with with all of that. Uh, oh, someone, Teaching has asked. You said you did your master's research at MIT. Um, are such re overseas research opportunities common in German master's programs or is it case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, um, actually it's quite common, not just Germany, but like Europe in general, where people um, like spend a semester or something like that abroad um, in, within Europe, outside Europe, things like that. So yeah, it's quite common. And yeah, what you need to do is just to yeah, not the UK. Like, <laughs> apparently, nobody in UK does that. Uh, but yeah, all you need to do is just like send an email to whoever, whichever lab you're interested in, and you just tell them why you're interested. Can we Skype? Things like that. Yeah, I think um, you know, for anyone who's interested, the UK system is a little bit different in the sense that the master's courses in the UK tend to be one year, whereas in Europe, I think it's two years at least, right? If I'm not mistaken. It's, yeah, it's two years and it's flexible. So like yeah, some so people get, I know take three years, mm -hmm. two and a half years. 
Yeah. Nobody yeah, will whereas like, it's, it's not so flexible in the UK, unfortunately. So usually it's a strict one year thing. So that's why you don't really have time to do a semester elsewhere here of course if if you guys have any other questions um feel free to just like put them in the facebook comments i'm sure like jg can will, will answer them um and you can always connect with him as well if you want to learn more about planarians or what he's doing um, in mit so thank you so much jg for sharing about your work i think everyone learned a lot um thank you as well to the audience um for all those great questions that you guys posted up um for next saturday we will be joined by Jake Chua, who did his PhD at the University of New South Wales in Australia. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher studying ubiquitin and uh, how it can be targeted in human diseases. So I think that'll be really interesting for anyone who uh, is interested, especially in how the Australian research environment is. So do join us for that. I'm sure it's going to be really interesting and informative. For more updates on future Research Insider sessions, like the MBIOS and 100 Scientists of Malaysia Facebook pages, and see you next Saturday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.